you know, he talked about uh, six different orientations. Introvert <coughs> and extrovert. You know that one. Uh, superverted and underverted. You understand that one. And uh, also future and the past. Because um, we can um, we can have both directions. And uh, he told me once, well, the, the past we put it in a, in a museum. Which I thought, at that time I thought, uh, well, we put it in a museum and that's it. Goodbye, past, and we move to the future. But maybe then I thought that in the museum you put all the most precious things. And uh, because my um, psychotherapeutic practice, I can see that the past can be uh, a weight, but can be also uh, full of resources of all the good things that you've already done. Let's go back and see them. Let's see the qualities that you've expressed. But basically, he um, he was going towards the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I asked him what he thought about uh, uh, looking into past lives. I wanted to know all about my past lives. And he said, uh, forget about it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, past, in past lives you were worse than you are now. So why do you want to your past lives? <laughs> Focus more on um, what uh, is now and what you're building now and what you're building for the future. I think in building for him was a, a basic concept. Please feel free to uh, interrupt me, uh, ask questions. Uh, on topic, non non topic, because the, all the topics are connected anyway. And um, um, so he was uh, a future oriented, and um, it was very uh, strange because I was uh, a young man who had just been finishing university. And this was uh, in 68. Maybe you don't know <coughs> what was happening in 68 in European universities and North American universities. Mm -hmm. uh, not all of you. I see some, some of you uh, nodding, and some others don't have a clue, so I'll tell you. <laughs> because they were too young. And um, well, there was a big revolt, which uh, was a critique of uh, the Western uh, world and its values and uh, its methods. And uh, I was feeling quite part of that, although I felt that the politics was not somehow satisfying what I was looking for. Uh, but all the people around were very critical of uh, everything. <laughs> this society stinks. Of course, we enjoy those of whatever that society is <laughs> giving us. But uh, we were uh, very critical, and we thought the world was on the brink of a disaster. Uh, by the way, there is a new research that uh, shows that people in all different ages of humanity have been <coughs> thinking that we are uh, in an era of decadence. Mm -hmm. And that's a mechanism uh, that we have, that we <coughs> remember all, only the good things about our uh, infancy. And uh, now look at this. It is present, you know, it's, uh, and um, so we compare it uh, with, the, with the past and we 
in the very decadence. We think we are in the Kali Yuga, but uh, that was not uh, the way uh, as Jolly talked. And I came here, and I was the young one, and I was, you know, I thought the uh, uh, present uh, uh, was despicable in the future non-existent because uh, as um, Margaret Mead uh, had previewed that the end will come, the uh, world will come to an end by 1970. And, <laughs> and, um, and instead, as a Jolly's view was uh, for the future, it was full of joy and hope and you know, let's walk into the future because uh, some uh, extraordinary things are going to happen. He definitely had uh, that um, uh, conception, um, which is not uh, about progress, because progress is just uh, uh, the present getting uh, a bit better, whereas uh, evolution is Transformation, and uh, you don't even recognize what's uh, what happened. And um, actually, that's what what happened. Like there, were, there were several important transformations that happened since uh, Sejoli's death that uh, nobody was able to review. One of them being the digital. Uh, revolution, which I think it's always you know, sort of sensitive uh, uh, to say, oh, as Jolly would have said, as Jolly would have thought, but I just would venture it once and uh, no more. I think he would have been fascinated with the, the internet because it was exactly the way that uh, Teilhard de Chardin um, thought. Now, I don't know if you know who Teilhard de Chardin yeah. is. He's, uh, he was a, a Jesuit priest. He was the first to embrace the idea of evolution. You know, according to Christian doctrine, that the world would go on and on and on, and then one day there would be the end of the world. But there was no concept of the evolution. Instead, he embraced the idea of evolution, uh, saying that um, little by little that there will be a no-sphere being created. A no-sphere means the sphere of uh, meaning. Uh, uh, and that is uh, the planet becomes one in thought. That, uh, it, all the different parts of the world becomes one part of the same brain and Teilhard de Chardin had uh, talked about that long before internet. So that's why I say that uh, Sajoli would have been enthusiastic about internet. Um, it's um, um, well, let me tell you something else. Uh, you can, of course, you can get lost. Uh, I can, I can hear many objections about uh, um, navigating internet, and that is that you can get lost. You go from one link to another link, and you surf it. So surfing means to stay on the surface. Only. So of course, there are many damages. But in a way, without knowing. As Jolly had already taught one thing about the internet, when in his um, uh, essay on how to read the newspaper, which maybe you don't have heard about, and uh, he said that uh, we can uh, read the newspaper in a passive way, and just read sort of about everything that's there, maybe look at the gossip and be. Uh, have our attention be become the slave of the inessential. And uh, instead, uh, the idea was to use the will when you read the newspaper and just uh, 
focus on what you want to read and read in the closing newspaper and that's it. And I could see uh, the times when I saw him reading the newspaper, he was doing exactly that. He was choosing, you know, reading. And I think you can use the same method with the internet that uh, you don't get uh, absorbed into uh, a search that doesn't go where you want, but go where somebody else wants you to go. It's a different way of uh, using uh, your attention. So as Jolie's view of the future was incredibly, I could say, optimistic, and uh, I uh, was not convinced about that because uh, I said, how do we know that there is even so, such thing as uh, evolution? Because uh, look at what happened in the 20th century, and he, of course, had been a victim, a direct victim of, uh, of fascism and Nazism, so how could he claim that such a thing as uh, evolution is, is there? Um, and his response would be that you have to look at the, a much, much bigger picture. And of course, uh, all the terrible things are also part of it. But uh, uh, evolution, if you look at it on a greater scale, much greater scale, uh, looks um, very different. And the, what he suggested sometimes was to uh, keep abreast of what happens uh, in the sciences, in the arts, in culture, in politics, to see signs of, uh, of evolution, of this evolution emerging. And uh, his point is, uh, was that if you look at it hard enough, it, uh, you can spot it. The spot where evolution was uh, being born in somebody's ideas or somebody's uh, initiatives. And do you have any questions so far? Mm -hmm. No, let me talk. I have a question. <laughs> I was in my twenties at that time. And um, it was difficult to be hopeful about the future because the word overkill had been created meaning the capacity to kill all human beings on the planet several times over. And so the future did not look like a good place. I wonder if he had any reaction to that. What, the Cold War and um, you, the you threat of about the, the uh, beings the, and the all the that. Nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. you know. um, nuclear energy and the threat between Russia and the United States. Mm -hmm. That they were going to plunge us all over. <coughs> destroy us all because of their problem. Yes. Did he show any awareness of that? Well, I, um, I think uh, I can venture to say that uh, even though the end was near many times, I remember 1961 with the, uh, was it 62 with the Cuban uh, crisis? That was uh, actually, in my opinion, it was the closest time to Armageddon that I can think of in my lifetime. Uh, and um, in his vision, there would be uh, the end of, the, of this planet would be like a, a little noise and the music of the universe. Um, so it's a, it's a much grander, you know, it's an experiment gone, uh, gone wrong. The experiment can go wrong. We just have to do our best to make it uh, go right. Uh, he, uh, he was following all the uh, events, although he was also following, I found uh, his notes on uh, the phrase of uh, Kaiserling that said um, uh, those who, can, who are building in the future have no time to delve with the problems of the present. Uh, which is 
quite a striking, uh, uh, so he, his vision is, was towards the, the future, towards building the future. So he was not uh, immersed in uh, contemporary politics, also because the uh, Italian politics of those times were, was very uh, myopic. You know, they were all thinking about the different uh, the different groups and the different parties. Now, I suppose it's different. Not better, but different. Um, there was one time in which I saw his uh, real concern. And that was about Israel, oh. about which he had uh, a very great concern. And uh, his own unique view. Uh, many people uh, here in Italy were and are on the side of the Palestinians uh, uh, rather than, uh, than mm -hmm. Israel. And um, there will be a lot to talk about that. But he was definitely on the side of Israel. And he felt uh, he his Jewishness was very important to him, I think, although he never talked about it with me. And, but he, the, that one time he said, uh, oh, think about Israel. It was the only time I saw him anguish. Mm. Think about Israel and there. there he, it has enemies from all sides. And they all want to annihilate it. And when we meditate, he would end all meditations, remember this was 73, around that time, um, with uh, a universal blessing, love to all beings, compassion to all beings, joy to all beings, serenity to all beings, that is the Buddhist blessing. Uh, which is also a great technique to uh, be connected to uh, humanity. And I remember he, uh, when we went, came to uh, love to all beings, uh, he would say, uh, he would say east and west and, uh, and south and north, and he would say especially to the east. And I was always um, tempted to tell him that East of uh, of Italy is not Israel. Israel is south, so you have to name it. And, uh, and, and East was Yugoslavia. <laughs> and uh, but I, I knew what his answer would have been. He would say probably that I, my mind was too concrete. <laughs> and uh, but he really cared about about the war in the, in the Middle East. Uh, even more than uh, the um, annihilation. You know, at that time, Italy was, um, in a way, in the center of it all. Because we had both the south, in the south we had the south of the world, because the south at that time was very poor and the north was much richer, so we had the, this division was in Italy. Then we had uh, the east and the west, because we were part of the west, but we had the biggest communist party uh, in the world, apart from the eastern countries. Um, and we were right there in, in the center of Italy, and Florence of Italy, mm -hmm. in the center of Italy. So. Um, but uh, he wouldn't talk that much about uh, the possible annihilation. Did he end up persuading you that the future was brighter? Partially. <laughs> uh, or at least to do as if we are heading mm -hmm. to uh, 
actual uh, bright future, a um, uh, future full of reality. Because of course, if you if you see evolution from when we were just a, a universal soup, all the way to the the symphonies or the great philosophies, the great mathematical and scientific constructions, the great poems, that, you know, that took such, such an amazing... Uh, and uh, I remember him telling me once that, oh, how can you, can you not believe in evolution? It's so evident if you look at all this uh, uh, in the grand scale. Um, that was the time when um, an Italian intellectual, he was just an Italian intellectual at that time, then he became a world-known novelist. And Umberto Eco had written a book called Apocalyptici e Integrati. Apocalyptici are the apoly apocalyptical, you know, the ones who would uh, say, oh, the world is coming to an end, and this is just... Uh, the last few days that we have. And Integrati uh, were the ones who would say, oh, well, let's have a good time in the uh, consumer societies, it was called at that time. And I was definitely in the uh, apocalyptical um, party, but then I changed uh, when I came to study with Asajoli. Although I am, I, do have a myopic vision and I see the problems looming ahead and, uh, and so it's not always uh, easy to be, uh, to be hopeful and to be uh, but um, it's also true that uh, human ingenuity and human resilience has been uh, uh, such a strong factor in our evolution and we've, we've come a long way, we've solved, we've met with uh, so many different uh, uh, problems and obstacles and uh, uh, horrors and uh, we're still here, you know, out of the 24 different uh, human species, there's one that has uh, has survived so far, and that's us, all the others, like Neanderthal and uh, uh, I don't know which other they are, but they're 23, they're all extinct, and we're still there, so we'll see how we end. He said that evolution is a reasonable bet. So, we're all better. So, so, could I ask, when, when he was speaking about evolution, was he talking about, he, he named that, that the only species of humans, Homo sapiens or remains, um, was, he, did he, was he considering that uh, that species too would evolve uh, into perhaps another species, or that would, there would be some divergence in terms of that evolution? Uh, I have never heard uh, about, uh, him talking about another species. Probably the human species was enough. <laughs> uh, I know that when Steiner talked about the uh, uh, humans evolving in two directions, one was uh, uh, lower and one was higher, and then there would be other but uh, I don't think he was thinking in those terms. He would think of uh, all humanity. Mm -hmm. And I never heard of him. Uh, of course, the, uh, the idea was that uh, in the future, people would be self-realized. You know, that mm -hmm. they would uh, realize the soul. So, of course, that's progressive. That is, uh, First mineral, then uh, then vegetable, then animal, then human, and then uh, something else. In that sense, yes, humans who have uh, realized their 
spiritual self. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're working for. Mm -hmm. So in a few eons, we'll get there. In a few eons. Eons, yeah. 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 And all of this, uh, however, has to be seen in the light of eternity. Because if we forget about eternity, uh, we are lost. And eternity was very uh, important for us as well. I remember once I was uh, I was fretting and I was busy and I was in a hurry. And he told me, "What's all the hurry? We're in eternity anyway." <laughs> and uh, that really struck me because uh, we're always in the eternal now, whatever happens. And that is the point of the pattern. That maybe worlds and galaxies being born and the worlds and galaxies being lost, but the uh, world is uh, in the eternal now. Because if we think of and identify only about uh, hoping that the future will be better, uh, then it's, it's still a bet, but not that reasonable. If you have a, a stronghold in eternity, you're definitely in a better shape. <laughs> <laughs> but you're describing a, a tension there, aren't you, in terms of, of, kind of the eternal present and this evolutionary process? Yes, well, in, um, um, especially in the Catholic tradition, I think, we, uh, many people may make a uh, mistake Eternity for sempiternity. Sempiternity is time going on forever. So if you go to hell, you're going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and it never stops. Which uh, I was terrified by that day of child. But even if you go to heaven, you know, after a few million years, you there is being bored. <laughs> Uh, you know, what's in the future? Oh, don't worry, it's forever. You know. <laughs> but eternity is something very different. It's a transcendence of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, I must say that I saw in his eyes uh, when he was, I, I was, I would meditate with him every, every day, two times a day at midday and uh, in the evening. In the evening, he would often ha uh, he he would light the globe. I don't know if you've seen it upstairs. It's a, a sky globe, blue with all the stars, just to remind ourselves of the immensity of the universe. And uh, then uh, I think about universality and infinity. And when he was coming out of uh, meditation, I really could see that he was coming from another place, very far away. It was just... Mm -hmm. And uh, I found the notes by him saying, sometimes the re-entry is uh, a very happy one, full of uh, love and... Uh, a sense of well-being, but sometimes it's a very painful mm -hmm. because you have to meet with the world of matter again, with all its uh, dichotomies and clashes. Can I ask about that? The, um, I'm thinking of uh, there's a there's an essay, a chapter in a book about the Arthur Yanov, the primal screen. Yes. Okay where he critiques, he critiques everything in order to sell his method of course. Uh -huh. That's what, what happens. But he, he actually bothers to cover psychosynthesis. And he lumps it along with Maslow um, and Carl Rogers as part of the kind of human uh -huh. the, the, yeah, integrative kind of approach and so forth. And he, his critique of psychosynthesis is pithy. 
and is pithy, uh, the pith, mm -hmm. the centre of something. It is, um, this is an avoidance of pain. Uh -huh. This, this, whatever this is, it's a, it avoids dealing with suffering. It doesn't turn towards human suffering. And, I mean, it's an interesting thing to have an outside critique of something one cares about and mm -hmm. stands for in the world. I think it's healthy and useful, but I wonder, I mean, this was written long after Sergio's death, I wonder how he might have heard such a criticism of his... Now, that's a, a very good point, and a, a partially, I think it's uh, to what, uh, what year is the book? I think it's around about late 90s, 2000. 90? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, especially in America, but also here, uh, uh, psychosynthesis was presented as a, a new age uh, kind of psychology. Mm -hmm. by, um, by new age, in this context, I mean uh, you know, let's all be happy and superficial, and let's all get high. And, uh, uh, you, um, uh, you are what you think, and, uh, and so on and so on. And, um, but as Jolie had uh, written, he, first of all, he had gone through the through pain in his own life, and he had written about pain, although. Uh, Gano would not have been able to read the read it because it was in Italian. And um, in his preface to uh, his uh, son's book, Ilario, the very interesting uh, passage where he talks about the uses of suffering that. Uh, Without, uh, how can I say, having a triumphant uh, view of suffering, as sometimes is done in the Catholic uh, um, uh, tradition, that you know, if you suffer, that's good for you. You have to be thankful for suffering. But um, some suffering, of course, is unavoidable, and. Um, it has many different uses. One is that of stimulating us so that our life is not so comfortable mm -hmm. and uh, showing us a different perspective also. Uh, developing empathy and learning from our mistakes, you know, the school of life. So I think Yanov's critique was uh, um, Right, if you take the, you know, there are all different kinds of psychosynthesis. The psychoanalytical uh, psychosynthesis, there is the Gestalt psychosynthesis, there is New Age psychosynthesis, uh, there is the Zen psychosynthesis, uh, and then there is psychosynthesis psychosynthesis, <laughs> uh, which of course I am a representative. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm joking because nobody is, even as Jolly said, he would not be the main representative. Uh, uh, but the uh, psychosynthesis that's toward to its origin would definitely start from, uh, from there, from suffering. We, last year, you may know that the Psychosynthesis Institute in uh, Kiev in uh, the Ukraine, and uh, I got in touch with um, the main leader, Diego uh, uh, Kurechenko, who uh, sent us a, a, a PowerPoint for a conference. That was wonderful. And uh, uh, basically, uh, what he's learning now, you know, he, the time was psychosynthesis in the times of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, psychosynthesis actually was born mm -hmm. mainly during the war. Mm -hmm. It was put to, to the test during the war. So I'm certain that Professor Jolie's uh, 
you um, did not avoid pain. In fact, uh, uh, in therapy and counseling, we the first thing we meet is trauma, is pain, is suffering. Uh, a counselor or a psychotherapist that tells his clients, uh, uh, oh, you know, you know you're suffering, but don't worry, you'll be happy, and uh, someone will teach you wonderful life. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a terrible counselor. Um, so definitely. So, and the research has proven here. The, the research in post-traumatic growth, they looked at how people who had gone through a grave trauma, how they were 10 years afterwards, and 70% of them had uh, discovered new values mm -hmm. and uh, had had some kind of uh, renewal. So there are uh, suffering is part of human life and we better know how to look at it. Except that for many people, suffering is uh, um, it's a terrible thing to uh, run away from. And that's when they apply disidentification in the wrong way. Because uh, you start right away with saying, oh, I'm not my body, I'm not my feelings, I'm not this, I'm not that. Then, of course, you run away from the real thing. First, you have to go and identify and uh, I mean, look at uh, what actually Yanov should have read <laughs> the Divine Comedy. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, definitely, uh, uh, as a jolly, uh, near psychosynthesis, I would say almost based on the Divine Comedy. You go in the lower realms first. And uh, and then only after you've gone to the deepest depth, you can get out and look once again upon the stars and then walk up the mountains of the mountain of purgatory and go to heaven. So, Yano, very good divine. Did he refer to the Divine Comedy in the teaching that you did he illustrate any of what he was teaching by referring to Dante? Um, uh, I think uh, uh, Sir Jolly was um, thought that Dante was uh, an enlightened uh, person. That's pretty clear because in, uh, in uh, when uh, he visits heaven. Yeah. Um, he describes uh, transpersonal experiences mm -hmm. as they usually described by people in many different cultures. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Dante himself wrote in the letter, I, I wrote the Divine Comedy to teach those who are in misery to get out of that misery and mm -hmm. to reach a state of happiness. That's where he started in the first lines. Mm -hmm. Yes. In misery. Yes, he started in that because that's uh, how so many people uh, live. You know, I can tell you something that um, you may not know. And once I ran across when I was putting all his papers in order in the 70s after his death. I ran into his testament. There were two testaments. One, the second one where he said they give everything to the institute, so that's the valid one. But before that, he had, had written another one in which he had uh, written uh, basically, I can't wait till I get out of this place. <laughs> and, uh, from this valley of tears. Yeah. And uh, I always thought 
uh, value of tears, then you know that is the a Catholic expression uh, was uh, too dramatic. Uh, I see in my work, but also not in my work, in the headlines, all the different, the incredible variety of sufferings that there are in the world. I really think it's, it is a value of tears, which uh, does not, uh, should not stop us from uh, uh, from having joy and from being joy. In fact, it's uh, a much deeper joy if we have met them. I get a sense that you lucky people who were with him experienced a lot of joy. Experienced yes. a lot of joy with him. Yes. Maybe, yes. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you got me moved there because uh, I remember an episode. Yes, forgive me if I start crying. Uh, we would do the usual uh, blessing. And uh, I, uh, once I accidentally opened my eyes and I saw and he was saying joy to all beings uh, he was really joyful and luminous mm -hmm. but then he realized that I was speaking <laughs> and he opened, he opened his eyes and we made him joy and after that he often remembered would both open our eyes <laughs> joy. <laughs> Lovely. That was quite a fit. Well, he would have this um, uh, extraordinary energy. He would, he would come in a room and everybody would suddenly be happy. Um, And uh, that's how the, the healing uh, would come. That uh, people, people would just walk into his uh, uh, office and they would be all gray and hunching. And uh, then after 10 minutes, they would come out and they were. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I asked him, well, how do you do it? <laughs> and he said, oh, it's very easy. You can do it too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he had to do two things. One is salute the self in that person. Mm. And the other one is bless that person. Mm. Uh, and, uh, well, I don't know how much it worked, <laughs> but it, at least it worked a bit. So coming back, please, please keep coming in with uh, questions. That, uh, I find it very helpful because it gives me some idea of where you are. Um, an important thing to realize about Master Jogi in the future is how he would see the world. This is very sensitive ground here because he uh, believed, like Heiserling, that the nations have a soul. They all also have uh, a personality, personality, and they also have sub-personalities. And uh, usually that's what's coming up as they engage with each other. That's where war comes from. But uh, you can see the soul, the self, in uh, the greatest uh, civilizations, in the ancient Greeks, in the Renaissance, in, uh, uh, in uh, Germany and Austria of the uh, 18th and 19th century, in uh, uh, the, uh, 
in the early uh, 20th century and so on and so on. That's where the soul comes out of the various countries. And his idea was that each country has a soul, which is what it can contribute to the, to the whole world. And um, some countries are older. This is the sense of it now. And some countries are younger. They still haven't produced uh, the masterpieces that uh, Western civilization has. Uh, and of course, somebody today would say, how do you know? Do you know, have you ever heard of original music or have, have you ever spoken with uh, an African shaman or, uh, you know, and, uh, how, how do you know? So that's a, a valid objection. This is a um, very dangerous uh, territory to go in, but I still think uh, the uh, basic concept is, uh, if you think about it, it's extraordinary. And that is, what happens if each country offers to the rest of humanity its soul? And if we, uh, all nations meet at that level, it's uh, staggering. But uh, there is um, a long way to go, I think. I recently, I started reading a book called The Weirdest People in the World. <laughs> it's, um, it's a very good book. It's very humbling. It's written by an anthropologist. I can't remember his name, but Weird is an acronym standing for Western, Educated, um, Industrialized, um, then the last one is democratic, the D is democratic, and I don't know which else. But it's basically us Europeans plus the Americans plus uh, <coughs> Japan, you know, uh, and the rest of the world is out of this. And what this book says is that 90% um, of, of the research in psychology has been done on weird people. Mm -hmm. And so all the edifice of scientific psychology is built on these premises which are crazy. And basically 90% the samples are mainly students from American universities. Now are they the uh, uh, compound of all human beings on earth? I doubt that very much. There are different kinds of humans. So, having a sense of this relativity. Now, the other problem with uh, psychosynthesis of uh, the nations is that uh, it um, risks falling into stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, uh, the Italians are always late, and uh, uh, the French are very mental, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the German, the Swiss are very precise, and the Germans have an encyclopedic uh, uh, way of thinking, and the English has a sense of humor, which is, you know, they, it's like the jokes in English, in that man and the uh, German man and French man, and there's a dialogue there, and that kind of stuff. It's, always very close to be like that and then we are lost. But if you think about the ideas, it's an amazing idea and it's the one part of Asajoli's work which has been least developed in my opinion because it, it's hard to think of all the how many nations, only 190 or so in, in the world. And we have to deepen 190 souls and their traditions. Mm -hmm. Who's able to do it? Maybe it's the yeah. new evolution. And it's <coughs> Maybe it's the new evolution of human beings at this Maybe. level of energy. Well, the, um, 
Of course, uh, the uh, internet has brought uh, mm -hmm. uh, that a lot. Mm -hmm. But we still think it uh, in the state of time. And uh, when they, uh, they had the um, uh, international, the uh, Olympic Games in London, there was a big number of uh, helpers that worked uh, as volunteers. They gave them a booklet in which they described all the different <coughs> nationalities. And uh, uh, just in a few words, you know, like the, the Brazilians are uh, always late, and the Italians <laughs> are not in sex, and, uh, and so on and so on, which was uh, terrible. And, and I tried to get hold of, of that manual, but I think they took it out of the <laughs> <laughs> It would have been a great example of uh, stereotypical thinking, which is, uh, we will all have it. Uh, doctors and psychologists <coughs> first, because uh, they have to put people in a category. Mm. But anyway, talking about the future, the future has that, you know, the uh, recognition of uh, mm. the soul in uh, each nation. And I think uh, that uh, that is beginning to start or has begun already for quite some time because we uh, did get and we are getting in touch with uh, other cultures much more than we used to. And uh, the first is through, uh, most elementary, of course, through food and through music. That's the easiest way to know. Um, I remember when uh, there was just one Chinese restaurant in Florence, and it was the saddest place. <laughs> uh, nobody went there because uh, people were, you know, they didn't want, they want food that uh, their parents had given them. And now instead, uh, we're pretty open to uh, all kinds of uh, foreign foods less than other countries or less than uh, other cities, but that is uh, the beginning of recognizing. Uh, because the, the food is also, the soul is also the food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the food is also the soul. Would, would, would you say, you know, a, a, a further step of that is also to include that the world has a soul? You know, the earth, uh, the, the trees, you know, the, the prime example is Aborigines talking to the stones, you know, that shows them the path and the stones speak to them. And I think that there is a need for an awareness that it's not humans that specifically hold the soul because we need to have a, that really important relationship with the world as it is. Well, that's uh, interesting because uh, we are uh, thinking, both in psychosynthesis, I think in general, we are thinking of uh, how healing in nature can be. Mm -hmm. How healing being in nature and uh, being part of uh, nature is perhaps much more healing than any sort of therapy. Mm -hmm. is, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I agree with the eco-psychology that all our troubles started because we uh, divorced from uh, mm -hmm. nature and this is only how many years ago, 100, 150, 200. Uh, now we can, uh, we find it hard to see the starry sky. And, uh, because of the uh, light pollution. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are far away from nature and that uh, brings uh, people to uh, many uh, difficulties, mental and physical. But that came uh, only uh, much later after Sajoli died. Mm -hmm. 
It was not a way of thinking that was prevalent at that time or was even uh, starting to surface. Of course, there had been the book, book of Rachel Carson, and, uh, but it was not, um, so I really didn't say many things. We, we're interested in that. We just made the video the other day on the significance of nature in, in, in psychosynthesis and in therapy. Uh, but uh, nobody talked about it in those times. No. Although I, I, I was wondering about it in terms of psychosynthesis going into the future. You know, that, that if Asajori had been alive, that perhaps his thinking would have gone that way as well. Well, that is certainly the way to go, or one of the ways to go. I can tell you that uh, he uh, adored the, the sun, and he would uh, go out uh, the balcony here, uh, and he would just uh, uh, stay on a chaise long, how do you call it there, uh, and uh, with his hands like this, because I can tell you, there are chakras here to, to just uh, absorb the prana from the sun. And, uh, he did. Uh, he did love uh, nature, but uh, he did make um, a method out of it, so, so to speak, or uh, an approach or theory out of it. So you won't find much in his notes. But uh, there's not, nothing in psychosynthesis that contradicts that. And it's certainly the way of the future. To come back to nations, maybe, don't you have a feeling that division into nations is a bit the matter of past and the future holds something different? I'm sorry, I didn't understand uh, your words. So, I'm wondering about the, some discussion that division into nature, nations is the matter of past and future holds something different. Well, it, it would uh, uh, seem so, because uh, if we uh, do not uh, uh, ally as uh, humanity, um, to uh, meet the dangers that lie ahead, um, we won't survive. So uh, nations uh, are the past, not divided, I mean divided nations, but uh, the uh, spirit of a nation or the soul of a nation is something different, and that is not divisive, that is uh, mm -hmm. universal. And uh, I think uh, we have to recognize all the different uh, pristine traditions and contributions that each people gave to the world, and that is in no way contradictory to uh, being close to nature, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. The division among nature, of course, yes, that has, the, the, that has brought the expo exploitation of, uh, of the earth, and uh, mm -hmm. that's the danger. Did, just picking up on that, did Asa Jolie see the United Nations which was new then, as kind of the eye that would, that would allow those different, the diverse voices to be more in harmony. Is that how you in this I don't know. There are some notes, I think, of, of his on the United Nations. He really hoped and believed in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you would consider this uh, the eye. Maybe yes. Mm -hmm. But certainly he be believed and hoped a lot in uh, in the United Nations as a place or as a way for all 
the people in the world to uh, unite. Uh, and um, I know many people don't believe in it anymore. The of the yes, well, the evolution goes through disappointments. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I've been working lately with so the um, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then recently out of Sweden, there's been a big movement with the Inner Development Goals, which is exactly what we do in psychosynthesis. And they're connecting, so they're saying the Inner Development Goals are what we need to enable the Sustainable Development Goals for leaders to embody. Uh -huh. um, and it's almost as if they've just discovered what we've been doing for a very long time. Yes. So it's, yes. <laughs> but there's a lot well, of we, can, we cannot tell them all we've done. <laughs> we've been a long time. <laughs> but I think we can. I think, well, you know, I think what we can, and what I am willing to do, what I am doing is joining in the conversation. Because I think we have a lot to bring to that conversation from psychosynthesis. Um, and maybe a, a, a different perspective to bring to that conversation. Yes. So I think it's worth. So I could stand out there and say, "Well, come on, you're telling your grandmother to suck eggs." Or I could, <laughs> or I could go in and say, "Let's, yes, let's talk." But it's an interesting. It's an interesting movement they're trying to build. Ah, that's good. Good mm -hmm. uh, You know, there has been. Um, a uh, uh, chat on Facebook about the colonial thinking and psychosynthesis. Mm. I don't know if you've come um, into it. Uh, and um, there's some quite uh, interesting point they, they make that uh, psychosynthesis has some um, uh, colonial uh, words uh, like um, uh, um, we are dominated by everything we identify with and we dominate everything we decide the word that word dominate from the beginning I, I didn't like or my generation didn't like it already uh, there are some and uh, the uh, the conquests of inner worlds. Um, actually, he, he said the conquest, uh, the exploration and conquest of the inner world. But their military wording, that uh, little did he know about everything that was, uh, they were throwing down the statues of Christopher Columbus and, uh, and so on and so on. Um, Maybe some of that is his thinking in Italian and speaking in English or writing in English. Yes, but even for an Italian person like me, the word uh, to dominate mm -hmm. uh, used in uh, a psych uh, psychologist, uh, psychological context mm -hmm. was. Uh, yes, me too. Right. I translated as govern. Uh, govern. I translate govern. Nominare yes. as govern. Yes. Or master, although also master is like some kind of a colonial mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. And it's true, isn't it? That psychosynthesis is a white, almost exclusively white only space. And, uh, and it's, it's changing slightly. It's changing <laughs> slightly. One black person in the room. Um, I, when I did my training, there was one black person doing the training, and another one came and, and, and was actually rejected by the process. So I think it's a big, big issue. And, and I had been wondering about raising it, but when you said what you said about colonial language, it just oh, yes. it made a big scare. Words are incredibly important, and we should never uh, undervalue the power that culture has over us. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when uh, 
At some point, I worked with a group of uh, people, peace workers, and, and half of them were from Africa. And uh, I did the disidentification exercise with them. And one of them said, oh, but this miserable little I, I am my village. Mm -hmm. the, I cannot just be an I. And, uh, uh, I would agree with that. I think uh, both things are true in, in a way, but uh, there was certainly a cultural misunderstanding from uh, my point of view. And uh, when um, I went to Japan, also was I thought it was uh, I don't know, it was just like us. And I, anyway, psychosynthesis is universal. Psychosynthesis is the way it is now. It's not universal. It's Western. It could be made universal, but uh, uh, and today it could be made universal. But of course, as a John, his uh, his own time was very universal for his the, the existing standards. He uh, knew six or seven languages, and he was conversant with uh, many people. But you couldn't ask. Uh, more from the, a person from the uh, 19th century. But uh, from us, from ourselves, yes. What about the gender ratio? The gender issue. Mm -hmm. that the ratio, like the, because now, certainly when I was studying, there were a lot more women. Yes. And when Asajali Jolly was teaching, what was the gender ratio? Um, Usually there were more women than men. Uh, but also men. Uh, I don't know. It, uh, the way I see it is that we all, first of all, selves, souls. Yeah. Then we have a, a male or female body and but we ourselves and uh, as Jolie had uh, well I can tell you another story and that is that he uh, what was the name of that author that wrote uh, I always remember her name uh, I forget her name the feminine mystique the, the uh, first Betty feminist Betty ever Betty Friedan yes Betty Friedan in her times, he was famous, and uh, and when I saw her name in, in a group of people who had come to visit as a joy, I was amazed, you know, Betty Friedan, because I had to lead the group also. Betty Friedan is in my group, and, uh, and uh, I remember she had a, a one. She was very open. She had this vision of uh, 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 a rainbow going from uh, male to female, from men to women, as you know, finally making peace. And I think it was quite meaningful. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, uh, as Jolly wanted to uh, give. Um, her some writings of his. And I told the secretary, please, whatever uh, uh, booklets you uh, get, uh, don't give her uh, women in her psychosynthesis. <laughs> <laughs> which is a jolly had written that uh, a, woman, uh, a woman is the queen of the house. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> but the secretary had her own way of thinking. And what they just on top of all the notes? A woman and person. And we never heard about them from Betty Friedan. <laughs> uh, a wonderful person. A wonderful person. As um, uh, himself at the end of his life, recognized that he 
had made a mistake. He had changed his mind <laughs> about uh, men and women, and that uh, uh, we're both souls, and that's the way to look at the human being first, whether young or old, uh, female or male. First of all, it's a soul, and he was already doing that, but he had not conceptualized regarding genders. So, in a way, if you have a group and they're all women or, or they're all men or whatever, it's the same thing because they're all souls. But uh, it's true that um, women are the great majority in the, the work that we do. Uh, maybe in this uh, part of uh, history, this period of history, they are ahead or we're they are growing faster or they're catching up. Um, uh, since we talk so much of uh, feelings and uh, emotions and uh, imagination, maybe at this time in, uh, in history they are more in touch with the uh, feelings, but I must make a point here that uh, I don't agree with Asajoli when he says, uh, "Will men have uh, a more developed uh, mind and body, whereas women have developed uh, a greater intuition and feelings?" Um, maybe because my mother was uh, uh, very willful and mental, and uh, my father was very emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I, I know there's such a variety of uh, mm -hmm. I prefer not to think in terms of those categories. So And wouldn't you say that might be nature versus nurture? How so? Well, if we are if we are souls and we all come in black canvas, why are men why why is it believed that well men shouldn't cry or men you know that they don't have intuition or they don't it's more of a, for at least that's how I think, it's more of a social thing or it's more of a social teaching and, and, you know, and ingrained in you at birth, a man should open the door for a woman. Uh -huh. well, why can't a woman open the door for a man? Why, if we are just a soul, you know, and we are equally female and male, you know, masculine or feminine. Yes, although that's not so easy. We, you say that we come into a black canvas? Mm -hmm. Black. A blank. Blank canvas. Well, uh, I used to think that way. Okay. And uh, especially when I had children. And I said, now that I have children, <laughs> I will mold them the way. <laughs> and, and I will turn them into exterminators. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I just saw that they were their own beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, shapes us. And I think the evidence we both are true. Mm -hmm. What uh, many scientists say now, based on uh, the um, study of twins separated at birth, you know, this, mm -hmm. you know there are all these stories, two stories of, mm -hmm. uh, of the twins meeting uh, for the first time mm -hmm. uh, at the airport and they wear exactly the same clothing and the same jewelry and uh, and uh, they have the same cars on and so on. But uh, they say 60 or 70 percent is genetics and the rest is environmental. So 30 percent to 40 percent environmental is not a bad uh, figure. Yeah, uh, what did uh, Sajoli think about religions? Uh, did he think that uh, they would be still useful in the future? Religions. What is not about religions? Religions, yes. Well, uh, he uh, came from uh, a basic respect for all religions and for all different traditions, thinking that uh, the core of each um, tradition is uh, the same. 
Of course, there are uh, then uh, degenerations and uh, degradations of uh, spirituality because every time you want to organize the spirit, you run into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, but we knew that from uh, a long time. You know, remember the story of the Karamazov brothers when. Christ comes back and uh, he said, well, why didn't you, you accept me in the church? After all, I'm the one who started. He said, there's no more place for you. Slam the door closed. So uh, it's also true that um, that uh, religions can be uh, a weight on, on people and uh, they can be uh, uh, a wonderful ally. If somebody is a Christian, for instance, we can do better doing the dialogue with the wise being, we, uh, we can do the dialogue with the inner Christ. We uh, Usually, in counseling and ther psychotherapy, we uh, go into the cosmology of the client, and we start from there. We adopt uh, his or her language and view of the world, and move in there without trying to change it, but um, seeing uh, what uh, what. Can, what may happen is that we can help them. What, uh, sometimes they have to uh, move away from religion because they work, uh, you know, there, there is such a thing as uh, religious abuse. Um, and sometimes uh, religion is the dearest thing that a person has, and you certainly don't want to rob that. From, from him or her. So it's, uh, and of course, of course, those were the times a little later of the Catholic, uh, of the uh, Council, the great, the Second Vatican Council, uh, Council that opened the, uh, at that time at least, the Catholicism to, to the world. It was a a big uh, atmosphere of uh, universality, of um, an openness, just for a few months maybe. There was a wave of uh, renewal and of hope. And uh, let's see what the next one is. <laughs> you knew him right at the end of his life. Um, did he talk to you about his death? Did, did, did you have a final conversation with him? I mean, how? Because you, you knew him as an old man, right? I guess. Yeah. Well, I asked him if he would be around <laughs> after that. <laughs> you know, after he was dead. And uh, where was he going to be? And, uh, was he going to help us around? And he, he said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He was serene about his death. Um, for him, it, I think genuinely was just a, a change of plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But non uh, sono uh, indovino. I'm not saying I'm not saying indovino. Fortune teller. Fortune. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fortune teller. Thank you. Uh, so I don't know the future. I don't know what But of course, it's also through the uh, the very first time I met him. He talked to me. Uh, he mentioned uh, a book by uh, an Italian pacifist called Capitini. He's the one who started the 
the peace march from Peru that was easy that people do every year. And he said, uh, Capitini had uh, written a book called uh, La Compresenza dei Morti e dei Viventi. Uh, the, uh, the Compresenza, how would you translate that? It was the Compresenza of the people who were alive and people who were dead. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they're around, but how are they around? Well, um, as Frankl also said, that uh, even if, if you don't believe in survival of the soul, you can easily admit that the people who are dead are still inside you, and they're alive in your presence. If you're whole, old enough, you probably um, change your relationship with your parents after their death, in many different ways, the relationship continues. In fact, it's more essential. You uh, you don't talk about uh, what am I going to get at the supermarket, but uh, it's more about you know, what did this person say? What was this person to me? So, what else did, did we say about his death? Uh, well, he said also. After me, the deluge. After me, the deluge. <laughs> half joking, yeah, half not joking. But, uh, he knew that uh, his disciples would all you know, fight with each other and uh, uh, look for power. And uh, some of that certainly did happen. And, uh, also, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, uh, when the spirit has to be expressed to a form such an institution, as I was saying before, there are many problems. And, uh, but his idea was that uh, you would be with that. <laughs> <laughs> And I think, but that's my personal view, that he trusted perhaps too much some people, and he made the wrong guess. And, uh, but but uh, even Jesus did that. <laughs> so, and he had this habit of uh, seeing the soul in a person and uh, not seeing enough of the limitations. And uh, his entourage often had to say, wait, wait, before you know, you let that person become the head of the psychosynthesis center somewhere in the world, make sure that his uh, not just a nice hippie, but uh, mm -hmm. also that he has a good training because uh, he will see the soul, and of course, your soul is always heavy. <laughs> Would you say, though, that that also kind of goes to those circumstances which were real after his death and good judgment and not so good judgment and what has emerged and what is still present for psychosynthesis. When you began speaking about the future in a much larger hopeful sense in terms of possibility and evolution, that it's all the there, it's the fertilizer for which things grow and develop so that maybe Maybe, we won't ever know. I like to think that perhaps the judgment that may not have been the best will result in something in this movement and this evolution of which couldn't have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. that, that the sprouts will come again. And they are. Um, but that, that in, in the moment of choice or decision or trusting or passing on in those particular circumstances, but also applicable to all things, this, this trust, this belief of evolution 
and that there will be this movement and this unfolding. Yes, well, that, uh, I uh, trust that the revolution will happen. And I think many people trust and bet on it. Uh, personally, I also trust that uh, uh, psychosynthesis or psychosynthesis worldview can be part of this, an expression of this. And if it won't, the evolution will go on anyway. <laughs> So, so none of it is a mistake. Yes. It is all part Maybe of Maybe we'll be called a different name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I tend to be a traditionalist. I tend to want to uh, acknowledge the original work that has been done. Um, but even if it is not acknowledged, it just keeps mm -hmm. working. Do you know the work of the WISE organization, W-Y-S-E, which was a psychosynthesis initiative, I think taken from the Trust in London, started, to um, information training in psychosynthesis to young people, potential world leaders from different countries. Uh -huh. Are you aware of that? The WISE? Did you come across that? The, the WISE? W-Y-S. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I know that. Yeah. And uh, I was even present when you started. Uh, because uh, Marvin uh, made the announcement in 1988 conference that we had in the mountains in, in Venice. And uh, I don't know how they're doing now, but I know they've had uh, a big success for so, uh, many years. Uh, I sometimes I have been in touch with Andrew. I don't know if he's still uh, doing it, mm. um, but uh, I think it's a wonderful initiative with great exercises that uh, they have invented. Yeah, in practice. It's exactly yes. Okay, then we can uh, mm -hmm. thank uh, your mm -hmm. attention. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't become devotees, though. No. <laughs>